So I wanted to uh, show the book that came out of the letters eventually. This is some years later um, after we published, republished the Bellical Indians. Um, and uh, this was so much fun to write. I was able to go back into the archives again and, uh, and discover, among other things, that Bellacoola, this little community that's so isolated, has uh, a long time uh, Norwegian settlement that was a utopian settlement that was put up there in the 1890s. Uh, I, I uh, met some of the descendants of that, some, one of whom, who was then in his 90s, who, who was in the boarding house where McElroy stayed, uh, and met various other people who remembered them. And uh, it's also where I, I learned that the famous Tor Haradol during the Second World War had lived in Bella Coola, and that's where he first came up with the idea that American Indians had been the original settlers of the Polynesian Islands. He originally claimed that they were New Hulk from Bella Coola and later on changed his story to be Inca. Um, so it's funny how things, funny how things get connected in different ways. So in the 90s, uh, we, late 80s, whatever, uh, Anne and I had our, our child, Jessica, and it wasn't possible uh, to go to New Guinea for long periods of time and be away. I wanted to be close at home. And I also wanted to pursue the, the work I'd done as a postdoc on Northwest Coast uh, people, and particularly Christianity. So at that point, I started to work on, um, do a, a tour of different uh, churches in different nations, uh, which was fun. And then that evolved into another project looking at uh, Anglicans in uh, among the Niska people, where um, really interesting, it was, it was not originally a high Anglican Catholic church, as was the case in North of, of uh, Papua, but it became increasingly ritualistic over the years. And it was a church where in the 70s, the, the church had been deeply involved in land issues, had apologized for the mistreatment of First Nations people at, much earlier than most other churches in terms of residential schools, and where they had encouraged the indigenization of church services. So when I went up to the Niska territory, most of the priests were themselves Niska, which was amazing. Uh, the churches had the crests of the different uh, family lines within the churches themselves, and the sermons were preached at least in part in the Niska language. Uh, so it seemed like a very interesting parallel case to what I discovered in New Guinea. And of course, there were many differences as well. Um, and one of the differences was it was a very different kind of field work in part because one is working on a, on a res reservation uh, kind of situation, an area where people have experienced extreme um, disrespect and mistreatment from uh, government agents and from anthropologists and others in the past. So it was far more suspicion than I had encountered in New Guinea. Um, interviews were more challenging in some ways to do, although they were wonderfully rich and people were very, very generous with their time. Um, but I just found the need to organize things in a new way did not appeal to me the way that I had back in New Guinea where I could just be walking through a village and be invited up to sit on a veranda and uh, not worry about so much about um, paying people for interview time and things of this nature, although we give generously when we do research in these places. It just was a very different style of research that I found much more challenging. But the stories were fascinating, and I think really important. Um, and I did publish one major article on this, and I've since published a number of things on missionary ethnography on the Northwest Coast too, which is another one of these areas of a kind of semi-lost literature that has rich, rich information on, on the traditional cultures and changes that have occurred in these communities. And I'm really, I'm very pleased to see that more and more young scholars are now moving into studying uh, Christianity and First Nations, and not least First Nations people themselves. So that's been very gratifying to see. Um, another thing I kind of experimented with was to study uh, white Christians. Um, and so another project I got involved in, uh, care of Simon Coleman, who at that point had not moved to Toronto, but was a, 
scholar of Christianity in, in England, uh, was on, on world creationists and on this uh, belief among several lines of, of Christians that the world is 6,000 years old and that the uh, Genesis has to be taken literally and so forth, which has always been thought of being as a very American phenomenon. And in the course of, of talking to Simon, I got interested in reading about it and learned that some of the most important creationists actually had been Canadians who had gone down to the United States and found their fame and fortune um, but had come up with the ideas up here for some reason. I became curious to know why creationism had never caught on in Canada the way that it did in the United States, or if it had, why we didn't hear about it, because you, you have these massive political battles in the United States and nothing in Canada. So we actually had a battle over creationism being taught in high schools in Abbotsford here near to uh, Vancouver, and so I made that my new field site. And I spent a, a, a wonderful season uh, interviewing creationists who are really nice people and reading these wonderful publications about our human ancestors playing with the dinosaurs, the design manuals for the ark, uh, trying to work out how they could fit all the animals and dinosaurs onto it. And you know, this weird kind of, uh, for me, kind of weird and wonderful work of people who, you know, I found tremendous respect for them. And really, they really were very polite and they really it's in some ways like when my, my New Guinea friends would talk about spirits attack and all the rest of it, it was very real for them. And uh, they weren't forcing their beliefs on me or anything else. It was just, it's just the way things were. So that was an interesting cultural experience with people who looked like me and talked like me, but have wildly different kinds of worldviews than I do and are passionally committed to it. And it's, it's a, a, a kind of perspective I'm still very interested in. I, I'm a, a big fan of the work of Tanya Luhrmann, who is a Stanford um, anthropologist who has been studying um, uh, new evangelical, new age evangelical Christians, you know, who talk in tongues and all the rest of them, and basically taking them seriously. And um, I think this is a really important aspect of being an anthropologist: is is we 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 most of us have these blinders in our certain areas, and so for a Western anthropologist, it's definitely Christianity, because most of us. Uh, growing up, have rejected the church or the synagogue or what have you, and so it's it's it, we look at it with some suspicion, and and not it's it's not that that's a bad thing. Uh, many Christians I know look at their missionaries and others with tremendous suspicion as well, um, but it, it's really important from an anthropological perspective to try to understand things from people's own perspective and from points of view. And uh, Lorman has done this brilliantly in her work, and she's taken a fair amount of hits for it. But what does she ask the question, what does it mean when people say that they talk to God, they, they have coffee with God, they have take walks with God? What does that mean? How does that feel? And so forth. And uh, I, I try to some degree to do that same thing with my creationist work. It's like, what does that mean to, to be a Canadian creationist, though, as opposed to an American one? So we live in a wonderful multicultural society of tolerance. And I realized that this helped explain why this was a huge political issue in the United States, where you have freedom of religion you know, in the, in the Constitution. And it's, it, it means the government can't impose a religion. It can't favor a particular religion. And people fight about religion all the time. It's very political. We come up to Canada, and it's, it's, not, it's partly tolerance and partly it's just not something people fight about a lot. And so the, the blow-up about creationism in Abbotsford lasted for a couple of months, and then it just died down. Uh, creationism, I know, is taught in, in high schools in Alberta and so forth, but people don't get so worked up about it. They find quiet ways of compromising and all the rest of it. It's very much like how I learned how Canadian provincial governments have long had separate schools, you know, incorporating other religions, you know, basically within a, a, a general... Uh, kind of, of, of syllabus, as long as that's accepted and so forth. And somehow, um, n by no means perfectly whatever, Canadians just don't get so excited about religion. <laughs> you know, and this, and this helps explain why you can have creationism here and, and people just don't care that very much about it. I also got very interested in this from a First Nations perspective because many First Nations people are, in a sense, creationists. They're, they're traditional stories for the New Hulk, have the ancestors coming down from the sky as animals, and when they get on top of the mountains, they throw off their animal cloaks, they become humans, 
and the cloaks go off as animals. They can still communicate with each other. Um, you know, so their version of Eden is this coming down from this house in the sky. It's a creation story. And all the First Nations have creation stories. And some, many of the First Nations have become evangelicals who also believe in the, crea in the Christian creation story. And they meld the two together. Um, but they're sincere. And so part of what I struggle with with that article, too, was just, again, as a responsible anthropologist, how do I respect this? And how do I portray this? I'm not going to make fun of this. I'm going to try to understand this and, and put this into words as best I can in a respectful way. Because it's just sort of a wonderful example in some ways of the creativity of the human mind that people can put it together. And it also struck me as wonderful to be in a country where this doesn't turn out to be a huge political fight and people have to divide themselves uh, to the degree you find in the United States. So, so that was... That was another great learning experience. So I was in doing this work on the Northwest Coast, doing this work uh, with Canadian creationists, uh, publishing a few things on, on the Mycene, but not getting back there very much. And then uh, out of the blue, in, in, in 1995, I get a letter from one of my older brothers in Uyaku, um, in which he writes, among other things, um, I'm going to be in Berkeley California, how far is Berkeley from Cali How far is Berkeley from Vancouver? <laughs> and this came as a really big surprise, to say the least. And um, he had mentioned uh, a, a person called Lefkadio Cortese, who was uh, Cortese, who was a Greenpeace activist who lived in Berkeley, uh, who had invited a, a number of Mycene to come to Berkeley to do a big display of tapa cloth. And they were displaying this type of cloth as part of an anti-logging campaign. So uh, we went down, my family went down to Berkeley. Uh, we became involved with this, this uh, project where they showed the Mycene type of cloth as contemporary art. It was in contemporary art museum rather than the anthropology museum. And there was a lot of uh, environmental activists who were part of this and all the rest of it. And my friend Franklin came and stayed with us for a couple of months. Uh, at her house. And while he was there, he and I worked together on a school book, uh, of which we're both very proud. It, it's a collection of Mycene stories, both in the Mycene language and in English, uh, which, we, which I privately have published. And I keep sending copies back to be used in the local, two local community schools. And out of that project also came another one, which is a record of Second World War stories. Mycene were, my men were carriers during the war. Mycene women experience the effects of not having their menfolk there, as well as having a volcano go off in their backyard during the war and the threat of Japanese invasion. Um, so they're rich, rich stories, which I also put together into a school book and uh, have been sending that back to the village as well to be used in the local school. So that's also something that anthropologists do. We don't get heralded for it much, but it's part of, of giving back to the community and, um, and being connected to the community. So, um, so Franklin stayed with us. We worked in this material. And of course, at this point, I am absolutely determined I'm going to get back. I really want to get back. And um, so this led to, uh, led to a number of things. One is they started learning about that there was a, a lot of people visiting Uyaku all of a sudden. Uh, so when I first been there, you know, we, we might see a white face at the airstrip, which was not 12 kilometers away, which in New Guinea, without roads, is a half day's trip. And we might see a white face there once every four or five months. That was about it. Um, so it, it just was not happening. But I was starting to hear about all sorts of people visiting there. Uh, there were websites now appearing. The World Wide Web is just really taking off at that point, which had wonderful pictures of the village where I had worked and of people I knew and stories about them and things like this. And so it seemed to me that I really wanted to get back there, but how to do it in a way that would uh, be helpful to the local people. And the story right then was that uh, they live in an area with an immense rainforest. And the rainforest, um, it's not immense, actually. By North American standards, it's pretty small, really, when you think of it. But it looks immense from the bay. And uh, it, it would be fairly accessible to loggers to take trees out. And in Papua New Guinea, as in much of the Southeast Asia, there's been pretty much uncontrolled logging 
a pristine rainforest. And so there's been suggestions year in and year out, going back to the 70s, about allowing a company in to cut the trees down, replace it with plantations. And when we were first there in the early 80s, um, people were gung-ho for this. They, 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 they thought this was their only route out of poverty. But something happened in the 80s where most people changed their minds. And part of that was education. One of the first biologists in New Guinea, my friend Lester Seri, is a mycene uh, and uh, has worked with many international um, uh, biologists and botanists like, like Tim Flannery and so forth. So uh, part of it was education. Part of it was the awareness that they were hearing from other people around New Guinea that people got ripped off and uh, they didn't get real money for their lands, which were destroyed. There were no plantations, which just this mess of tree stumps and bramble that was being left behind. So for whatever reason, they turned against it. And they did it in a very interesting, smart way. Um, about a third of the Mycene population lives in towns, and this is because they had early access to education. And so even though the villages are quite isolated, there's a lot of really well-educated people who have come out of them, and they're quite connected. And so some of them are in government, and they know the ministers and so forth, and others are very good with publicity. So they started connecting up with environmental activists at that time, including this friend, this, this guy, Lefkadio, invited them to visit the area. They came in, they saw how beautiful it was, how exotic it was, you have all these women with tattooed faces, they make tapa cloth. It was kind of like the perfect place for an environmental activist to be because the people look so darn traditional. Yet you can get, at that time, you could get there within a day from Port Moresby because there was a direct flight. And then if you had a dinghy, you could do it all in a day. Lots of people could speak quite good English. Uh, it was easy to bring in your own food and all the rest of it so you didn't have to eat the local stuff. And, you know, so it was very accessible, uh, and, and, and yet it looked really, really pristine. So it, it, it worked really, really well for activists, part of whose job is to raise money to keep their work going. I'm not saying this is criticism, it's just the reality. So my scene suddenly were besieged by people coming in. There were uh, two flights a week from Port Moresby. Every flight had activists who would come in for two or three days. And the activists were coming in from all over the world at that point. So I arrived in, in 97, spent six weeks there, and I met a lot of these activists, um, including a group of, of Japanese scientists who came in with this amazing Japanese nun, Sister Yasuko, who was a feminist uh, person, uh, in, in, wanted to save the rainforest, tiny person. Meising were terrified of her because she spoke very, very loudly and kind of, which you don't do there. And because they, she was very generous with them. She bought them a satellite phone. I mean, the, these places are very isolated and things like that. She would tell them they have to preserve their culture. And then she would tell them that men and women have to do things together. So this is a society where men are very dominant over women. Sister Yasuko would, would actually order women to be on the shelters eating with the men, which is something that you never would do traditionally. And I remember one time when this was happening, one of my Mycene friends whispered to me, this is torture. Um, but they loved her all the same, and they would kind of tolerate this stuff. So it's something else I, I learned from this time. These activists were coming in. They were having workshops on thing, raising butterflies, on sustainable logging to be used by the local community, on all sorts of projects where people could earn money without selling out their lands, the major one being tapa cloth. So they were working very hard at building up a market for tapa cloth, both in Papua New Guinea, but over, over overseas as well. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and really doing a good work in, in, in that respect, you know, much, I felt guilty. I mean, doing much more than I had ever done. On the other hand, they didn't know anything about the culture or the place, and they projected these romantic stereotypes on the place. So I heard the most amazing things about the Mycene, about, you know, how so-and-so was the paramount chief, and this is a society where you don't have chiefs, and, um, and how their custom is to always do things in this particular way, which I had never seen or heard of before. Um, and, and so, and this was in part, you know, Mycene 
scrambling to kind of meet the expectations of these outsiders coming in who obviously have lots of money and, and, and trying to get support from them because they really didn't want to lose the rainforest. And they really did want to find alternate ways of earning money. Everybody's being sincere, but it's this crazy quilt kind of mixture of, of, of uh, perspectives, objectives, motivations, and so forth that's going on. And meanwhile, film crews are coming in, CNN came in, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation came in to do um, you know, news things. They're doing stories about how these people, uh, Mycene people are all warriors and how they've been isolated and how they're gonna fight off the bad developers. And people got dressed up in their traditional garb and they threw spe fake spears and stuff like that. All the stuff got into the films. And, and, and yet they're interviewing people speaking perfect English. It's just to me, it's sort of this kind of weird mix of things that's going on that I've just found really, really interesting and fascinating just to, to watch. And I also wanted to help. And so I got recruited by uh, a new NGO that had been set up um, by the Mycene themselves called, uh, uh, called the uh, Mycene Integrated Conservation and Development Group connected to another national NGO called Conservation Melanesia, which uh, soon was run by Lester Seri, by this uh, biologist, um, to work as a consultant with him to, to do some studies about just how all of this was working out and whether any of it was going to go forward. And that became my new research project, uh, was to, to take a look at, at, at the mix of these things that are going on here. Um, and I was just particularly just fascinated and uh, by what does it mean with this community where all of a sudden there's people who will ask you to set up a delegation to fly to New Zealand, Australia, Germany, Korea, Japan. Uh, there are delegations going off in various places showing off tapa cloth, which I showed you earlier, uh, and most of them are made up of men because uh, the people will not allow the women to go. And then some women do go, and they go to Philadelphia for a fabric workshop place where they're making tapa cloth designs, but they're not using bark cloth. They're doing it in different media, which actually doesn't do any good for the people back in the community. And when they go back, the women get severely criticized, and they're actually in some danger because of the jealousy that at least the sorcery in this community. Not against what was happening, but there's all these complexities that are part of the story as well. Uh, women are working there, the, the people who are coming in see themselves as primarily helping women because women, and rightly so, because women are much more responsible with money and with their households and all the rest of it, and women make tapa cloth in this community. But because of all the visitors coming in, women are working their butts off because they're providing all the food, they're, they're working harder in the gardens, they're making more tapa cloth. My, 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 my mothers and my sisters are exhausted while the men are sitting on verandas and planning about how they can get more and more money and fame. And this is all spinning into stories about copyright. Um, there's at one point talk that Patagonia, the big fashion company, is going to incorporate Mycene designs. There'd be money coming from that and all the rest of it. And so um, this became the theme of my, my later research and my continuing research. Uh, when I, I wrote several articles on this and uh, on just what does it mean to have sudden fame. And uh, at that point, too, uh, I also started thinking about what I do in the classroom, which I haven't talked about at all so far, but I've been teaching, first courses I taught were in introductory anthropology. I love teaching first year courses and second year courses. You know, I like all teaching, but I've really enjoyed teaching students who know nothing about anthropology, nothing about Melanesia. And um, I, th I had not written a full ethnography on the Mycene. And I decided I wanted to write an ethnography that actually would appeal to first year students and first year instructors, not by talking down to them, but by constructing a book that actually reflects the way these courses usually get taught. And the way they usually get taught is with a textbook and the textbooks are usually broken into chapters on economics, on social structure, on, on change, and so on and so forth. So I, I thought, well, I, I, you know, I don't want to do a book that, that pretends these are separate domains of life, but um, I could do a book in which I, I shift the focus 
from chapter to chapter along these ways, so it could be used alongside a textbook. And I thought, that's, that's not quite enough, too, because I want to also get something that's a running theme. So I thought, what could be a running theme in this book? And I thought, well, of course, tapa cloth, because tapa is really how people identify themselves, and that's really been brought home with this rainforest thing. So I thought the other way of doing it is to personalize it a little bit. So I constructed the book chapter by chapter in terms of me making a piece of tapa cloth, how I was taught to make tapa cloth, and how each stage of making the cloth ties into one of these dimensions of society. And then once the cloth is made, it ends with the story of this fight against the rainforest logging, culminating in a, a victory in the National Court of Papua New Guinea that blocked logging in Collingwood Bay. Uh, the first time that a Melanesian group has opposed logging before it started. So these really are quite remarkable events. And that became, um, that became this book, uh, which came out in 2007. Uh, and at that point, um, right when the book was being completed, my wife and I went back to Uyaku uh, for a month, uh, the first visit back there since the year 2000, uh, to talk about the book and just sort of finalize things and all the rest of it. And, um, and at that point, I, I learned about another dimension of this, which is in 2002, after they won the national court case, all the environmentalists left, just like that. So one day they're famous, everybody's coming in, and then it's over. And we came back into the community, and our families and friends said, what did we do to scare away these people who are helping us? It was really interesting, but also really saddening, in a way, to have them hear them talk about that it was something they must have done because they had given so much, they had received so much, and reciprocal relationships, again, is so fundamental to the society. They must continue, they must continue. And, um, and they weren't. And so people talked about that a lot. They also talked about how the local airstrip had closed down, and this is true. We, we had to fly into an airstrip that's 40 kilometers away to get there, and transport is just very difficult. It's very hard to get petrol for Boats anymore, uh, outrigger canoes take, you know, two days to get from two feet to, to Uyaku if you have good winds. Um, so it's become much more isolated than it used to be uh, at that point in 2007, although now there were th three radio sets in the community, there were some solar panels, and, um, and a lot of people who had retired to the village from towns who had brought stuff with them, including laptop computers they couldn't run <laughs> because they had no... They had no energy. So it was also fascinating looking at the changes and looking at just how much more, in some ways, the village was integrated to an urban kind of mindset than it was too. People's bodies had changed. We saw, for the first time, people who were overweight. We had never seen that before. Um, these were retirees who were not setting up their own gardens. They were depending on young men and women to work for their gardens. We saw more inequality. We saw a little bit less sharing. Um, but it was not all bad news. I'll pick that up in a moment. <laughs>